Hi friends and welcome to Costume Me in Color. This is a YouTube show dedicated to showcasing amazing costumers of color and those that support them. Hi, I'm Gigi, a cultural history buff, historical costumer, and dabbleist. And I'm Noelle, a costumer who likes to play both sides of the historical and cosplay world. Today we are interviewing Hugh. Welcome to the show, Hugh. Hi, thanks so much for having me. I'm so excited for today. Thank you for joining us. First, some house rules, though. The first rule of Costuming in Color is that you tell everyone about Costuming in Color. Exactly. This way, even if you don't have people of color in your local groups, you can get to know some in our global community. The second rule is that kindness matters. Aside from that, there are no rules. So let's get into it. Where are you from and do you still live there? Hi. So I am from New York City. Um, that's kind of a loaded question, though, because I've lived across the country. Both my parents are service members, uh, so we lived every two to three years. So I've been everywhere from the Los Angeles area to, uh, well, the D.C. metro area. And I currently attend Howard University in Washington, D.C., so that's where I'm at currently. Oh, awesome. So what is your favorite thing about where you live now? So I really love D.C. I mean, there's a reason why I wanted to come back to this area for college, um, I mean, it wasn't necessarily because I wanted to come to HBCU, oddly enough, even though that's one of the best things about Howard, uh, but it was because I wanted to be back in D.C. And I, I love it because it's such an authentic, such a real city, right? It's a city kind of caught in limbo, a city fighting for statehood, a city fighting for a fair existence, really. Um, but you know, even despite a pandemic, even despite the hurdles thrown on it by the federal government, even despite white supremacists deciding upon it on January 6th, 2021, DC is here and DC is still thriving. And I just love that about this city. It's so resilient. It's so incredible. And its history is just all the more interesting to get to like research and get to know a little more about. Um, so I'm, I'm proud of the city. I'm proud to go to school here and I'm excited to see what the future holds for me here in DC as well. That's amazing. Yeah. For anybody out there who doesn't, uh, hasn't been to Washington, DC and thinks it's like just, just government or no. It's amazing. It's a really cool city. It's super, the vibe there is super awesome. It's, it has all the vibes, like all of them. <laughs> it's so true. I mean, DC has things that are like authentically DC, like Google Music. You have like Half Smoke, which is, um, it's like a hot dog kind of like sausage kind of thing. And you even have like mumble sauce, like this, uh, this really unique kind of like reddish, like orangey sauce as well. Like goes with, like chicken and stuff like that. So it was just such a, a cool city that has so much more than just a federal district. I mean, I really encourage you, if you have the chance to check out the city, you know, leave Pennsylvania Avenue, leave the National Mall, go north, go south, go east, you know, check out what the city really has to offer because it's so much more than the White House or the Capitol Building. Yes, but also stay on Pennsylvania Avenue for the Smithsonian's because that stuff is awesome. <laughs> that's true. That's true. That's true. That's definitely true. <laughs> and that belongs to you, people. It does. So what is your IG handle and why did you choose it? So my Instagram handle is USC Trooper. That's U-S-C-T-R-O-O-P-E-R. -O -O -E it's a little unique, but what I basically did was I smushed the word or the phrase USCT, which is an acronym that stands for United States Colored Troops. These were the 200,000 African-American soldiers that served in the United States Army during the American Civil War. So I smushed USCT and Trooper together. And that's how I got USC Trooper. <laughs> Nothing terribly exciting. <laughs> uh, well, it's very informative for me because I thought you went to USC for a really long time. <laughs> the, that's one thing that I've always thought about. So whether it be University of South Carolina, University of Southern California. So there's so much that kind of goes into it, which is part of why I'm actually torn with the idea of changing it. But the, the real tea behind it is it's a mix of USC T and the word trooper. I understand toying with the idea of changing it, but it's like a teachable moment, you know, like mm -hmm. people are going to ask you about it because they're going to wonder and then you get to teach them something because yeah. a lot of people do not know that there were USCTs or to the extent that there were like how many 200,000 is a big number. It really is. It definitely is. And that's a great point, Gigi. I appreciate that. Yeah. I'm like, definitely take your, uh, take your, uh, take your work for it. I'm probably going to keep it down. So that's a real good point. My two cents. <laughs> So two while, cents. We're on the, while we're on the subject of my two cents, um, <laughs> I think the work you do is great, which is why we wanted to have you on the show. How do you describe the work that you do? Uh, what labels do you use? What do you call yourself? What should we call you? Yeah, so 
I consider myself to be a living historian or a costume interpreter, depending on the work that I'm doing at any given point. And I say that because, you know, I started as a reenactor, someone who's more in this community of sorts, uh, to shoot guns, to just relive life and whatever period we're presenting, uh, versus what I do more now is more of an educational focus. You know, I work in museums, I do historical interpretation, like that focus is more about education uh, versus reliving the past, whatever that means, right? Uh, so that's why I consider myself to be a living historian or a historical or, or costume interpreter. Uh, I tend to use those interchangeably, um, but I also, you know, I mean, I think there's a little more nuance to it, but to keep it short and sweet, I think that's what we'll leave it. <laughs> that's a good question, though. A lot of people have confusion, especially people who don't live in America who watch the show, between costuming, reenacting, uh, historical interpretation, and living historians, and like what the differences between all of those are. So your answer is a great explainer for people. Also, just to add the costumer part is people who dress up in costumes and usually go drinking. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with that. That's just that's, not that's my the story. that I involved. <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah with the labels it's like the reason we want to know is so that we can understand you better not that we're trashing any of the other things that yeah. you could be called oh, like of course just to be perfectly clear about that i participate in something called the sca and a lot of times people want to call it a larp and i said no, no no we're not a larp but it's not because i don't like larp it's because i'm like you'll be disappointed if you're coming for a larp and you show up <laughs> at one of our events because what we do is like you know we'll be like come learn how to make cheese. You know, like if you're, mm -hmm. if you're coming for a LARP, that is not what you're coming for. For everyone that's who doesn't so know what a LARP is, that's a live action role play. And that's like, essentially, like say you were playing Dungeons and Dragons, you would live action role play your character as a woodland elf or whatever. And there are live action role plays that are vaguely similar to SCA, but yeah. it that's not the same thing. <laughs> and so being a, uh, a uh, living historian and a costume interpreter. Is that the word, the phrase you use, costume interpreter? Yes, ma'am, or historical interpreter. I use those interchangeably. Yeah, those are good things to note about the work that he does. So when you go to his social media, you'll learn more about the projects he's been involved with and a little bit in this interview too, and you'll understand exactly what those labels mean. So do you ever or would you ever do cosplay or go to cons or do that kind of thing? So I've never been to a, a convention like that before. I would be lying if I said that I wasn't like a thousand percent like pumped or excited or ready to go to one, but I would try anything once. So I, I would be interested in, in checking out and seeing what it's like. I mean, a bunch of, you know, passionate, incredibly passionate people in one space, you know, representing, you know, something that they're just truly excited to talk about. And, and it's a big part of their, you know, personality, their, their spare time, their interest, right? You know, just I think that is really interesting. And I think that's why I would be more interested in going to uh, a cosplay convention uh, to see people being just outwardly really passionate and being their, their truest selves. Like, I think that's really cool because I spent so long, you know, being unauthentic about, you know, my appreciation for history, my love for history and that outward display of it. So I think that'd be really cool. You should hit up New York Comic Con sometime. I definitely will have to. It's not that far. It's a four-hour train ride, so yep. it's a good yep. point, Noah. Back to the historical aspect of things, what time period or place is your favorite to educate others about? So I'd say my favorite time period or place to educate others about is the American Civil War. I mean, I think there's other things that are more impactful for me as somebody who is, you know, on one side, I'm, I'm biracial. You know, my father is white, my mother is black. I was, you know, born of the country and came here. So I'm the side of me that I think is more visually apparent, you know, being, you know, my other side, I just don't have those tangible connections to the American Civil War that my dad's side would, you know, who, you know, my father's family has been here since the 1820s. My last name is Belgian, but most of my family is Irish, right? And I have one or two Civil War ancestors on that side. But it, their story isn't something that I can feel as much uh, because, you know, as weird as it sounds, my Irish Civil War ancestors probably would have hated me because I'm black. 
mean, there was a lot of tension between the Irish and the Black community during that period in U.S. history, and most definitely in the Midwest as well, like Southern Indiana, like Iowa, you did have a lot of that tension between Black and white as well. You know, maybe there wasn't slavery occurring up there, but there was a lot of anti-Black sentiment. And so as much as I love my family, and I'm very proud to be a Goffinette, I'm very proud of my dad's family and, and where I come from, it can be a little hard to relate to that story, right? And I think as I started to do more research on the incredible story of African American Civil War, I started to get more of a deeper understanding of the story of Black people in America, but also just how incredible the story of African American contributions during that conflict, whether it be military or civilian experience, right? The average Black soldier or sailor is, is not something you can really explain in the sense of like, oh, your average soldier was 5'2 from like Baltimore, right? You really didn't have that. These, these black soldiers and sailors from across the globe of varying different socioeconomic statuses, right? I'm doing research on uh, Washington, D.C.'s uh, first U.S. colored infantry, the first D.C. colored volunteer infantry, which was uh, one of the early African-American regiments during the Civil War. And one of their veterans was a man from Kingston, Jamaica, right, who lived here in Washington, D.C., and my family is from Jamaica on my mother's side, so that's something I can appreciate too. You have, you know, people coming from Africa, from Canada, from South America, you, you name it. Black volunteers came, served, and many times sacrificed their lives to create a redeveloped, a, a new understanding of what it means to be American and what this country is all about, right? And so it's, it's my favorite, not just because of that, but because it's so crucial to understanding the United States in 2021. And really every aspect of history between 1865 when the war ends and the present day, the civil rights movement, Red Summer, women's rights, all of these incredible things come out of the American civil rights conversations. Uh, I mean, civil rights, that whole conversation really comes out of the Civil War era amendments or the post Civil War amendments to the Constitution, namely the 13th, 14th, 15th amendments, right? So I think it's such a relevant discussion to have and it's just interesting and different at least approaching it from, from that narrative. So that's my favorite time period. And that's why it's my favorite to educate others about. Who are your personal favorite people of the past? So I thought about this a lot uh, when I first saw the question. And I had a difficult time coming to an answer. I chose two because I think they most directly uh, impact who I am today. And those two are are Mary McLeod Bethune and Samuel Sharp. Um, Mary McLeod Bethune, because of course, she's just such a prominent uh, figure in the world of Black education and Black excellence. And of course, also for her work in allowing African-American women the ability to join the United States military. I mean, my mother is a service member and just like my father, you know, my mother's you know, career is very much tied to Bethune's fight to give African-American women a spot in, in the U.S. military, something that for African-Americans has always been the stepping stone for a broader future. Uh, and Samuel Sharp is a Jamaican pastor in uh, 1830s who led a not successful enslaved revolt in Jamaica, but successful in the sense that while on the battlefield, the actual revolt was suppressed by the British, but in the end, it was really the, the final straw in uh, Britain's efforts to maintain a hold over the institution of slavery in the colonies. It was Samuel Sharp's rebellion that allowed emancipation to be granted to the uh, colonized people of the Caribbean where my ancestral roots lie. So Mary McLeod Bethune and Samuel Sharp, two people that radically influenced my present, you know? And I think because of that, there are two of the people that I look up to the most. I have a sidebar question. Did sure. you say that your mother came here from Jamaica? She did. She was born in Jamaica and, and came here to the United States. And she um, wanted to serve in our military. She did not necessarily like out of the blue want to serve. Uh, I mean, for her, as far as I kind of understand it, it was more like she was looking for a job. So that's amazing advertisement on uh, the TV that explained all the great things you could do in the military. And because she needed the extra paycheck, she, she decided to enlist. Um, you know, it became, I think, something bigger for her 
you know, as she developed more of experience in the military. But yes, my mother wasn't born here and but still, you know, took the opportunity to give back to her community um, you know, through military service. And that's, that's a, one that's thing that amazing. I really respect about her. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. That's that's awesome. It, I would never have thought that someone from not America, especially a black woman, would come here and then give back in that, like provide service in that like most complete way, you know? Without a doubt. It's it's definitely unique, right? Yeah. But it's something that I can appreciate too, because I mean it's it's just been central to, you know, my life, right? Both my parents' military services. It's just been um, something that's been part of my development and then also a part of just my, like the way that I've been able to, you know, really accomplish a lot of what I've accomplished, you know, just through the resources the military has provided for my mother, but also for me as a, a young student or an up and coming young historian as well, right? I mean, my mother has struggled a lot, but I'm very blessed that she decided to uh, make that step. You know, my, same with my father as well. I'm very blessed that both of them decided to, you know, make careers out of that and, and you know, to make the world a better place, um, you know, whether it be in the macro level within the family or in the larger level, you know, on the world stage. But I'm very blessed that that's part of my story. Yeah. And, you know, I'm just thinking maybe after this interview, I'll give you a little, I'll give you um, a message about, I just learned my great, great grandfather was in the cavalry. Oh, wow. And from what I understand, to be in the colored cavalry, you had to provide your own horse. So I, th- I don't know a lot about him, but he came from the deep South. He was able to provide his own horse to do this. And then for his pension, what I found in his, his uh, military record, his wife and son wrote their Senator and like petitioned for him to get his full pension early because of the injury. So like, there's a lot wow. of dynamics here that I don't really understand, but maybe because of your um, research, you'd maybe be able to point me in, in the right direction to, look, to find more out. Because I'm, I'm super intrigued. I would love to. That's amazing that you have such, a, such a, a really awesome connection to this story. I mean, an ancestral connection. That's the deepest connection you could ever have. That's awesome. Yeah. Congratulations, you do. That's really cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's cool that I know someone who is kind of an expert in researching military stuff that I can talk to. So. Of course. Awesome, awesome. So I will be in contact about that. Um, Definitely looking forward to it. So how did you start in living history? I started living history when I was living in Texas. I was in, I think, fourth grade. I was out of Dallas, Texas. And my mother was taking me to some different reenactments throughout the state. We went to one of the Alamo reenacts in San Antonio. And I thought it was just really cool. It was my first time seeing it. It was like watching um, a movie, but just in real life, some fold before you. I mean, when I was in fourth grade, they were a lot cooler than they are now. I mean, now I just, because I'm just so used to them, it's like, oh, it's just a reenactment, right? But I mean, when you're like nine, it's just the coolest thing in the world. Especially when you grow up watching, you know, all those different war movies like Saving Private Ryan, Band of Brothers, et cetera, you know, for much of your life. And that summer, my mother took me to a reenactment in Northern Texas called Jefferson, uh, in Jefferson, Texas where I bought this little uniform just to like wear like a spectator just to just get into the vibe, get into the moment. And this cannon crew approached me and asked if I wanted to be involved. And I said, yes, mom said, yes. Lo and behold, this is probably a very unsafe thing to do to give some fourth grader, like a little like canister of like gunpowder to carry around in a, a box to give to a cannon. Yes. Yes. That it's is not unsafe. <laughs> but but it did what it needed to do to get me involved in this hobby. So would I ever suggest anybody do that? No, but, but I, I am very glad that they did do that, that they were unsafe so that I can get that little taste of this hobby and then further immerse myself in it as I got older. I mean, I spent years trying to find groups that would take me and eventually in South Carolina, like 2014, I found a group and I mean, the rest is, is history. What keeps you involved in the community? What keeps me involved in living history is my core little cadre of Black living historian friends who I see more as like family, honestly. Uh, people like Marvin Alonzo Greer, who some of you may know, people like Cheney McKnight, some of you, most of you probably have heard of. I believe you guys in Costume and Color have actually interviewed her. I um, hung out with her in New York. It was amazing. Okay. All right. Cheney's <laughs> good people. She's, she's, oh, she's one of my favorite mentors. I mean, I, I could 
speak at length about all these people that I'm naming, people like Joel Cook, who works out at Old Salem in North Carolina, who's a bit of a TikTok sensation I've seen. Um, but it's become a safe space for me to be, I mean, I guess to be authentically me, right? To be this nerdy little black boy, to be a part of this living history community, to talk about my passions, to just be me, where I can still grow as not just a black person, but also as a historian, to grow as a nerd, to be grown as a person who is unashamed of just who I am, right? Because when you grow up as a, a young nerdy black kid, you know, you're kind of put into these different categories and stereotypes types about what it means to be black and I internalized that in different ways in ways that were self-harming right not like I was doing anything that were detrimental to like my physical health but <clears throat> of course it took a mental health toll or a toll on my mental health there we go and it was just kind of difficult to understand and appreciate right when I was in middle school or even like late elementary school but because of you know my black living history family I've just felt confident to be proud of just what I do, who I am, and to take ownership of, of my story, right? So I think that's what really, at its truest sense, you know, is, is what holds me to this hobby and this community. I think this world needs more nerdy little black boys. Like a lot more. <laughs> I'd even look further than that and just say it needs more nerdy people in general, right? Yes. Um, I mean, nerdy people just have so much substance. And I think... Where some of the most specific people you could ever find. I'm very partial to nerdy black people, right? Uh, you know, the Marvins and the Cheneys of the world make my, you know, world go round. But I mean, they're just some of the coolest people you'll ever find. So I definitely agree with you there, Noel. That's for I sure. Agree. I also <laughs> agree. Hard same, hard same for thinking that we are so cool. And also, I can very much relate to looking back at my youth and seeing how much of a box I was put into because. I didn't meet people's expectations. Um, and so they considered me an exception to all their other roles. Mm -hmm. And they singled me out in a way that was detrimental to me. Although I didn't realize it at the time by telling me, oh, you're not like other black people. That's why we get along. And you're special because you're not like other black. But lo and behold, I have met so many other black people that are just like me. So uh I feel sorry for those people who thought I had to be the exception, who didn't realize that if I exist, there are tons of other black people like me who exist. And that's another reason why I love doing this show because I get to meet more of you myself and also introduce you to people who are not in your communities, who are like you and who may be struggling and feeling like they're alone. And I want them to know they're not alone. That's for sure. Black nerds are real. We exist. And I mean, we're, just a very unique category of nerds, right? We're maybe history nerds, you know, clothing nerds, costume nerds. But I mean, there's so many other nerdy passions out there, whether it be music, whether it be sports, right? Like we're all nerdy about something. And I think if we better understood that, you know, I think we could better understand ourselves in the end too. So I'm proud to be part of this community. I'm proud to be around people like you. And I'm proud to be able to tell a story, right? As a, a proud, strong black nerd. <laughs> Love that. So, uh, wondering a little more about your past projects, what are your favorite completed projects or impressions? So I think my favorite one is Free French, because, of course, the side that is just visually apparent, being my, you know, mother's family side, my, my Black side, uh, being from a colony that was, you know, of course, ruled by a, a European power, I can very much appreciate the story of these colonial soldiers fighting for the French army uh, during World War II. Of course, the Free French were the French soldiers during the Second World War who refused to stop fighting and who refused to accept the Vichy regime as the true French government after the Battle of France in 1940. And quite a large percentage, if not one of the largest percentages of uh, Free French soldiers during the war were uh, African soldiers, whether it be North African, Sub-Saharan African, uh, Senegalese, Moroccan, Algerian, Tunisian, you know, you name it, right? Uh, black and brown people were there fighting with the free French military, fighting to regain control of, you know, France after the Battle of France in 1940 and to regain the honor that they believed that France had lost, you know, with Philippe Pétain and the Vichy government. 
And so because I come from a colonized group of people, it's, it's their story, you know, not just their military service, but it's also how they use that military service to push for a liberation, to push for independence after the war ends that I can really appreciate, right? Like the Algerian War of Independence and, in, you know, the 50s, 60s, you know, during the era of decolonization, a lot of these revolutionaries were former free front soldiers, right? You know, so that tangible connection between military service and independence or liberation is something that I can appreciate because it's a theme that just runs throughout a lot of these stories that I talk about with African-American military uh, contributions to the United States of America, where Civil War soldiers are using their Civil War experience, uh, are using their sacrifice, are using that platform to push for civil rights in the years that follow during the period of Reconstruction. So I think that's my favorite completed impression, not because of the clothing, because it's just World War II American stuff, it's nothing exciting, but because of the story that's behind it. Uh, so, so yeah, it'd be free French. This is going to be a two-part question. <laughs> what future impressions do you look forward to working on? And also, can you explain to the dumb white girl in the room, what is an impression? <laughs> okay, perfect. So an impression is... I guess the best we can say it is it's it's the clothing you wear, it's your outfit, mm-hmm. um, it's it's all of that would be like your impression. Like I have an impression of the American Civil War, like an American Civil War impression, the USCT impression, and that being my blue Union Army uniform, right? Mm-hmm. That would be one of my impressions. And so there are two future impressions that I'm looking forward to working on at some point, uh, and those more so come in like year ranges. Uh, and one of those is the 1830s. Mm-hmm. As I mentioned, one of my favorite people being Sam Sharp. He led a rebellion of enslaved people in Jamaica in the 1830s. And I would just love to talk about that. I don't know where I would do that in the United States of America. Maybe at a Caribbean festival. I'm not sure. But that's one part of the 1830s is interesting to me. But then also you have Nat Turner's slave rebellion in, in South Africa County, Virginia in 1831. Right. And so these revolts of enslaved African descended people uh, in you know, respective colonies or countries uh, is, is very interesting. And it's just, you know, I think I'd be love, or I would love to be a part of telling that story, right? And part of telling that story is, is through the clothing that you wear. And the other one would be the 1910s. Being in DC, especially um, being tied to it through Black Lives Matter being here at Howard, it's been very interesting because I've had the opportunity to look back on DC's history, whether it be the 1968 MLK um, riots or in 1919 with the uh, race massacre that happened during Red Summer here in DC. I think, you know, a lot of that history is very much tied to the efforts of the Black community in the 1910s in DC, but also across the United States of America to assert themselves especially in the aftermath of World War I, uh, because you have black people fighting abroad, fighting to expand democracy as, you know, this was the trope that was being set at the time, um, you know, returning back and being able to, you know, reassert themselves to fight for uh, that broader future, which unfortunately with the nature of white supremacy at the time was unable to be meaningfully accomplished in the way that it was, at least in the aftermath of World War II of the civil rights movement in the 1940s to 70s uh, in the United States of America. But I mean, just that, that, that new Negro movement, the story of that, the birth of the Harlem Renaissance, uh, I mean, just the accumulation of wealth in the Black community during the 1910s, the Black college experience in the 1910s, you know, being out of circle of Black college, Howard University, it's something that I can just really appreciate. And I think that's why I would be interested in building a 1910s outfit, maybe military, maybe civilian, maybe both. I'm not sure what that would look like. And that's a, that's a much further in the future plan. But I think those are the two that I'll probably be working on first. So 1830s and 1910s. Both of those sound amazing. Yeah. Do you have a sentimental or nostalgic costuming memory that you'd like to share? I do. Uh, so again, I keep talking about being here in DC, it's just been the place where I've had the most personal growth. I used to live here in high school for a few years before moving, uh, of course, my parents being in the military, you know, we move so often, but it was just so central to my self-discovery, my journey of self-discovery at least. 
that I just have so much pride and appreciation for the city and its history. And so back in 2019, in June of 2019, I had the privilege of putting together a living history where we do demonstrations and talks and other things about educating the public about whatever topic we're discussing, right? That's what living histories are. Where we got to portray Black Washingtonians with the 1st United States Colored Infantry Regiment at Petersburg National Battlefield Park for the 155th anniversary of the opening attacks on the city in 1864. So not only was it the 155th anniversary, but we were there on the actual day at the actual time, um, you know, to the second that these guys were advancing across the very ground where we were camping at, where we were talking on, where we were doing these demonstrations at. That was a very powerful experience, but also because in the sophomore year of high school, I wrote an award-winning essay on a uh, black man named Zedekiah Thompson who was enslaved in Rockville, Maryland, which was the kind of sort of around the community where I used to live at the time, who served in the first USCT and was wounded in action at that battlefield on the very spot where we were standing, giving these tours, having these discussions on that actual day at that actual second. So that personal connection outside of being associated with the city of D.C., being associated with the city where this regiment comes out of, but, you know, having an award-winning essay about a man who was wounded on that actual spot, that just made it so much more personal. And so that little 155th anniversary you know, event at Petersburg was probably the most sentimental, but also as of right now, in my limited experience in this community, uh, probably the, the highest point for me um, you know, in my seven or so years as a, a living historian. That sounds amazing. Like, Thank you. Yeah, and moving, really. Yeah. This was really cool. It was an amazing experience. Yeah, those profound moments are what mm-hmm. I live for as someone who studies history and tries to connect with people in the past. When you have like this perfect storm that you described, like you were there the same time, the same place, almost the same second, you had already studied them cerebrally, right? Mm-hmm. You were standing in their place. Like that is, that's profound. Without a doubt. It's, it's so powerful. I mean, just to be in touch with the ancestors in that particular way is, is so unique. I mean, because I mean, being at a cemetery, a black cemetery is very powerful, but also just being in touch with the ground that they actually walked and, and participating in some amazing efforts to uh, defeat the institution of slavery in this country, right? I mean, it's just such a tangible thing that you can really appreciate, but then be able to connect with them, not just on that land, but also to the very second that they were there 155 years ago. I mean, it's just, it was incredible. That's that's all I could say. I'll never forget that event. I want to know a little more about, you've talked about your cadre of fellow living historians. What, what organizations are you in? So I'm in two. Uh, The first one is the Sons and Daughters of Ham. They are a African American civilian uh, living history organization that focuses on the 1860s, though we have tried to do things that is kind of outside of that field. And the second one is the Hannibal Guards, which is a subgroup of the Sons and Daughters of Ham that focuses on African American soldiers during the American Civil War. So those are my, my two groups. We've had yeah, quite a few people in the Sons and Daughters of Ham on this show. So, so Cheney, Cheney and Naomi for sure, right? Mm-hmm. Cheney, Naomi, um, many of you guys may know Marvin Alonzo Greer, Joel Cook. I mean, I could go on and on and on and on talking about some amazing, um, you know, Black living historians. I do this Mia Marie, some of you guys may know as well, as a part of the Sons and of Ham. We've got some amazing people. It's an amazing group. It's an amazing family to be a part of. Them. I'm so uh, proud of who you've been and where we'll go. Spoilers for next round. It's going to be Marvin. Yes. Ooh, <laughs> next interview okay. Is Marvin. Uh-huh. Okay. Okay. We're going for the collection. We're yeah. going for. Like, we want to get all of you. We're gonna make trading cards soon. <laughs> I'm done as a ham trading cards. I love it. Yeah. I love it. It'll be amazing. It'll have history facts on the back. You'll have to learn. <laughs> there we go. There we go. I love to see it. Yeah. There we go. So, who inspires you? So, my inspirations are my mother. I mean, I've kind of told you a lot about her. My grandmother. You remember my mother has been, I think, the most influential person in my life. My grandmother has been, I think, one of the other more influential people. 
I think just because of her sacrifice to bring my maternal family to this country, which of course is, is half of me, right? And so without her work, I just wouldn't be here. But even further than that, my grandmother was a, a domestic servant in Jamaica and in the U.S. in the 60s until like the early 2000s. And I mean, her backbreaking work to um, provide opportunities that my family, on my mother's side at least, is, is able to appreciate today, that I'm able to appreciate being here at Howard University, right? I mean, that all kind of comes from, from them, especially my grandmother. And the third would be my peers, right? I'm constantly challenged to be better by my peers, whether it be Marvin, Cheney, Naomi, or my peers here at Howard University. Uh, some of you may have heard about uh, some of the student protests here at the university uh, during the semester in 2021. And I mean, their ability to occupy the Blackburn Student Center for over a month in the face of Howard police, DC police, administration, um, you know, threats of expulsion, threats of even arrest, right? I mean, it's, it's been so powerful. And if these students could do, the students who are even younger than me, and I'm a sophomore, right? They're a freshman who are out there taking key leadership roles in this movement. If they could do that, then, I mean, what is it that I can accomplish? I mean, they just put in their all to ensure that all future bisons here at the university be able to have a better academic experience than this semester was for us, you know, in 2021. And so I, I take a lot of inspiration from, from those three groups, right? So, yeah. <laughs> that takeover was all over my news, like everywhere. So it's not... Yeah. In the, in the face of all the things, I live in California, that go on between where you live and where I live, that was headline news. So I'm I'm like, go you guys. <laughs> yeah, it was really interesting. If people are interested in learning more about it, you can look up hashtag Blackburn Takeover on Instagram. There's a lot of great posts about it. Or if you look at like Howard University student protests, like every major news station or, um, you know, print news media uh, wrote something about it. So it's, it's, yeah. it's worth looking into. It was a big deal. So I want to ask you uh, to give us a good word from some of your research. Sure. So I have a quote from Frantz Fanon, which says, the colonized man who writes for his people ought to use the past with the intention of opening the future as an invitation to action and a basis for hope. I'm read it again, because I think it's worth that repetition. The colonized man who writes for his people, ought to use the past with the intention of opening the future as an invitation to action and a basis for hope. It's just so powerful to read. It's so powerful to think about. And I think it really explains a lot of the work that we do in the living history community, especially as, as you know, people of color. Uh, so again, that's from France Fanon, who was a uh, Caribbean, um, you know, leader in the independence movement uh, through his writing, you know, through his, his thinking, you know, through a lot of his actions, you know, so his words just hold a lot of value to me as somebody who is descended from, you know, people from the Caribbean, but also as a, a Black man as well. If you could give a new living historian one piece of advice, what would it be? So I spent a lot of time talking about my tribe, right? And, or my, my cadre, my, my group of people. So my best advice for new living historians would be to find your tribe because you're not alone in this community. I thought I was. I looked around and I wasn't seeing a lot of black and brown people doing this weird nerdy stuff. And I thought it was just me, but no, like as this channel, you know, shows we're out here, we're doing some amazing stuff. So find your tribe. Find your community because you are not alone. And that's the best advice that I can give. That's solid advice for everyone about every hobby, for everything ever except for racists. Don't find your tribe. Be alone. <laughs> True. Die alone. Agreed. That's why I love you, Noah. You say things that I only think. <laughs> this is white privilege at its best, ma'am. <laughs> They're real. Yeah. So, Hugh, if you have a closing message you'd like to send out, now is the time. Sure, I do have one. And that's that the living history community isn't an easy one for Black or Brown people to be in. I mean, it wasn't 
created for us. There wasn't a space made for us when it was first organized, but we created our own space within it, right? We're here and we're here to stay. And it's up to us to ensure that we maintain that space, but also authentically tell the story of the ancestors by any means necessary, because I firmly believe that our existence depends on that. So that's my closing message. Thank you guys so much for having this. It's been so fun. I really appreciate it. Thank you so, so much for joining us. Like, it has been amazing to get to know you a little bit better today. And I, like, I, I want to come visit you sometime and hang out and, like, actually have drinks and talk and chill. Because that's like, Let's do it. Yeah. Let's do it. <laughs> All right. Thank you to our viewers for joining us today. We will leave a list of Hugh's information down below for you to go and follow him on all of his platforms and learn more about him. Also, please leave a thumbs up on this video if you liked it. Subscribe if you haven't. And if you have a costumer of color that you think we should interview, use the form in the description box below to tell us about them so we can contact them. So the reason that we ask you guys every time to leave a thumbs up and leave comments down below is because that helps our interaction and the interaction helps us get these videos pushed out to more people on the platform. And the more people who have the option to click onto these videos, the more people get to know these lovely costumers that we're talking to. So it helps us out, but more importantly, it helps them out. Make sure also to leave love for Hugh in the comments below. Stay safe out there and take care of each other.